Yeah. Let's get us started. Uh, welcome. This is our first session of Virtual Tumor Board uh, for this year, uh, 21-22. Very warm welcome to all the fellows that just started. I'm, I'm sure you guys are going full of speed now after the July. Welcome to the Head and the community for the folks who graduated and are joining us today. Congratulations and again, welcome as attendings now. Uh, we, <coughs> sorry, we have a fantastic session today. This is our first session of the academic year. This year we are going to do every month. Our first session is challenges in oral cavity. We are very fortunate to have a fantastic lineup of case presenters and distinguished guests. Our presenters today are Dr. Ashley Mays from Louisiana State University, Dr. Tavita Galloway from University of Missouri, and Dr. Evan Grabois from Medical University of South Carolina. And our distinguished expert faculty today are Dr. Peter Anderson, uh, Division Chief at Oregon Health and Science University, and Dr. William Lydiat from uh, Nebraska Methodist Hospital, the Chair of the uh, Administrative Division of American Head and Neck Society. Both are good friends and uh, amazing surgeons. All right, so Mike, I think, has a couple of slides to show you as an introduction, and then we're going to get started with the cases right away. Mike? Thanks very much, Bob. Uh, I'll keep this brief because I want to allow us to get going for the session here. Uh, mainly just give this as a brief background. Um, Welcome everyone. Uh, I'm Mike Moore. I'm a head and neck surgeon in IU in Indianapolis. Uh, and also a special thanks not only to Bobak, but Arno Buley, who's been intimately involved with the development of the curriculum. I, I wanted to just share a couple slides. I'm going to have JJ send this out afterwards uh, as a reference, but uh, I want you and your uh, co-fellows to know what resources are available. Uh, we've there's a lot of work that's been put into getting input as far as what would be beneficial, uh, but also a lot of effort that's been put into developing these materials and a lot of stuff is ongoing. Um, I would encourage you to familiarize yourself with the h and site. Um, and then if you go to some of the different tabs, you can get the resources that are there. So if you go to the, for example, the poor trainees tab, uh, you can go under the accredited fellowships and there's a what's called a curriculum 2.0. And I think the best way I can describe that is it's kind of a head and neck specific cochlea. So it doesn't tell you everything you need to know, but it kind of outlines what you should know. And then it allows you to go off and learn it. Uh, and then at the end of that, there's a um, uh, up to date reading list of kind of the landmark articles and what a lot of the decision make decisions are made based on. Um, there are these virtual tumor board sessions, which we, the, uh, schedule for this year is one per month um, based on different disease sites. And then there's also the, on the schedule of upcoming sessions, but also all of these are recorded. So these are available in archive on the HNS site. We're now in the process of working with the publisher on this book, uh, Essential Cases in Head and Neck Oncology. And thanks to all of the authors and section editors on this. This is a um, text that essentially is a case-based format. Uh, with all the different disease sites and between uh, four to seven um, cases per uh, uh, section. And then last, there are the operative videos. Many of you have seen the recon ones. We are also actively working on developing a plate of one. So I won't spend more time on this here. We'll send this out as a reference, but I just wanted you all to know that your uh, these are available to you. And then down the road, we welcome your participation. Uh, this service is a, a busy one and a lot of good stuff to do, and we would certainly welcome your involvement in it. So thanks. Let me stop right, sharing so we can allow the okay. presenters. I have, uh, on my list, I have Ashley. Ashley, are you ready to go? Actually, we had discussed, by we're going to start with Tabitha and then Ashley. And then Okay, Ashley. Tabitha, let's go. Sorry, this is going to be fast paced. So if I interrupt anybody, I apologize. Let's go. All right, let me share my screen here. Can everybody see that okay? Yeah. Yep. Great. All right. So thank you everybody for, for asking me to participate today. I'm, I'm excited to be here for this opportunity. So um, I'll get going. So my case is a 50 year old female who presented to her primary care provider several weeks after biting the lateral aspect of her tongue resulting in a lesion that just didn't heal. She said she had been pre treated for thrush prior to that and really had no bleeding and no mild, just a little bit of mild discomfort. So 
She was seen then at a community ENT who did a biopsy that returned as moderate squamous dysplasia. Um, her primary care doctor had referred her on and then the ENT had called me after her biopsy results were back just to see if she should re-biopsy or just get this patient sent our way. So she came on over to our office. She has a history of type two diabetes. She's a half pack per day smoker for about 20 years. Um, and so when we got her into our office, this is what her lesion looked like. Okay, so, let's just stop uh, right here quickly. So uh, Dr. Lydia, this is like, like our pain of our existence. Moderate squamous dysplasia, <laughs> you look in the mouth. How would you approach these? Okay, good. It, you're absolutely right. They, uh, superficial biopsies can oftentimes give you just a dysplastic look because you don't get enough tissue. And so it can, it's why it's always important to look and feel. This one, you can see the rolled border. You can actually feel how substance, substance, substantive it would be. Um, so the first thing would, would be to measure it and get a sense of the depth, uh, feel the neck, and, uh, and then talk to the patient about your concerns, which are that this is in fact an invasive carcinoma uh, and that a rebiopsy is going to be necessary. Um, certainly you wanna look at the history and physical uh, to see what kind of medical comorbidities. Uh, actually, Tabitha has already told us about the diabetes and the relatively mild smoking history. She's a young woman for, for having a cancer like this with a relatively mild smoking history. So sometimes these are associated with uh, a little bit more aggressive course, uh, other times not so much, so. Perfect. Okay, that was, a, that was excellent. Thank you, so thank you so much, Bill. So that's exactly what we did. We, um, we talked to her about how her biopsy may just not have captured the full, full extent of what we were worried about. And so um, I went ahead and did a punch biopsy. My preferred way to do this is to do a punch biopsy kind of at the margin of the lesion to avoid that shave component. Um, so we did a six millimeter punch biopsy and um, did that in the office. And uh, those results came back as a moderately invasive squamous cell carcinoma. Um, and uh, depth of invasion was six millimeters on her biopsy. So that was the full extent of the punch probably. Um, we had her external path re-reviewed here and really they confirmed that, that there was just no stroma, just a shave biopsy off the top. So exactly what Dr. Lydia was was mentioning. So from here, um, clinically, we couldn't feel anything obvious in her neck. Um, so we in our institution tend to move on to imaging as, as Dr. Lydia had, had spoke about. So here's just a kind of in the interest of time, here's her imaging. So we got a contrasted so, CT scan of the neck to start with. Quick question, and we are all memorial trained. So Pete, do you do PET scan nowadays for these cases? Well, the answer is yes, but not really because I think they all necessarily need it, but eventually they're going to get it done anyway, because that's what everybody does. But I think the, the important thing is that the person still needs a diagnostic quality CT scan because the PET scan anatomic resolution just isn't very good uh, for your surgical planning. So they probably need both uh, is what I would do, both the CT scan yep. and the PET Sure. That's, like, that's actually exactly what we do at NYU nowadays here. Bill, what about you guys? Would you re routinely get PET, uh, high resolution CT? How do you approach these? Yeah, no, we, we start with a CT scan and then uh, with that smoking history, certainly the lungs need to be evaluated. So I think you can go two ways. I think a, a CT of the chest is another reasonable way to assess for METs. Um, a PET scan, as Pete said, you know, and as you indicated, it's often done in part as part of the workup, um, but I would not specifically get a PET scan. Um, I think a Evan, lot, a lot of, yeah. a lot of the people Go show ahead. up on my door with a PET and no CT, because um, people think that the PET, since it's a PET CT, is going to be an adequate study. Um, I think you could certainly do a CT of the neck and a CT of the chest, and that would probably be adequate for what you're doing here, but. Around in Oregon, everybody winds up getting a PET scan, and so I just usually do it. All right. So on her so on her contrasted imaging here, we do for a lot of our oral cavity, we do this puff cheek protocol to kind of get the buccal mucosa, you know, spaced away and the oral cavity spaced away. Not so important for a lateral tongue tumor, but that's why you it may look a little funny to some of you, but. 
Um, so you can see the thickening here. That was a yellow arrow I couldn't get off that the radiologist put on the scan. Um, and then going through her scan here, um, she had a lymph node that was a bit cystic show up here in her oh. kind of right at the level two, three junction for her. And so we tend to start with contrasted CT scans. We don't usually start with ultrasound either, which as I know is another option some people prefer, but we started with a contrasted scan for her. And then since we had this finding moved on to a PET scan in lieu of any additional chest imaging. And so on her PET scan, here's the results from her PET scan. So um, there were no other avid lesions, no lesions in the lungs, nothing concerning systemically for her. Fantastic. Okay. so. CT, yeah, you've already got it there. Um, Pete, what would you recommend? Uh, well, I would do a hemiglossectomy and a neck dissection and probably, we around here, we'd probably do a radial forearm flap on her. I think uh, one thing that, you know, she's, she's 50, so she's not super young, but these young people, sometimes I will work them up to make sure they don't have Fanconi anemia um mm -hmm. and uh and i think that would i would primarily go with a surgical approach to this disease what well, and you do flap okay bill i concur i think the uh you know you're definitely going to do a neck dissection because of the disease i would you do unilateral neck dissection based on the location um i think that you know something can, it's it's worth mentioning that you can sometimes do a resection a wedge resection and do some primary closures. Um, certainly, you know, I think we've all moved on to doing a lot of free flaps, but uh, depending on the size of the tongue and the size of the mouth, uh, and as long as you don't tether, uh, which in this case, it didn't look like there was much floor of mouth extension. Uh, so I, I don't think it would be un, uh, uh, completely unreasonable to do a, a primary closure, though my guess is based on what I'm seeing that we would do a, a flap as well. Now, um, for a, if we, in this case, I'm not sure I would do a full hemiglossectomy, but it would be nearly, you know, it didn't look that mm -hmm. deep, deeply invasive. So in that case, I do, the radio forearm offers the advantage of a little more tongue flexibility. Uh, but if, again, if you don't have the tethering of the, and the resection into the floor of the mouth, um, a primary closure is not at all unreasonable. I, you so know, Bill, I agree with you. Go ahead, Bobby. Go ahead. Well, I was saying, I, I was just going to ask you, you can do a lot of primary closure on these people. Um, and it's not necessarily the wrong thing. What's what I always stress some? is what I always stress is that you want to make sure that you have good, you know, wherever the lesion is, the more anterior it is, the more you're going to interrupt articulation, the more posterior it is, the more you're going to interrupt swallowing. So in this posterior aspect, you want to kind of bulk it up with the, the way you close it. If you're going to do a primary closure, and the more anterior you want to, again, allow that flexibility. So um, again, I'd make sure that you don't tether the tongue. That would be the, the worst case. So now let me, uh, so I, everybody agrees that you need the unilateral, but let me uh, throw a wrench here. So if, if this woman goes to radiation oncologist afterward, they're gonna la do bilateral ra neck radiation. How come we don't do bilateral neck dissection? So I think the reason is, the reason you do it or don't do it is to avoid uh, over-treatment. Um, and I will, I'm, I suspect I'm um, on one side of the, the bell curve in terms of using radiation. I always make sure that we discuss the pros and the cons of radiation because it adds a tremendous amount of morbidity and especially when you use bilateral radiation. So. I think if I if my goal here is to completely avoid radiation, um, I I would, in this case I wouldn't. But I, I think if the lesion's more midline or or larger, uh, you may consider bilateral neck dissection. But again, only if your plan is to avoid radiation. And in this case, there's no clear cut uh, indicator for radiation. A single node. Uh, I'm thinking that lesion is probably one and a half centimeters, maybe. So. Given six millimeter depth, it would be a T2. Okay, very good. Pete? Well, I agree. I, I think that if you're going to rate, if you know that you're going to radiate him anyway, so this lady's N1, let's say she's N2, 
you're pretty certain you're going to radiate her. I probably would just, if I was concerned about the other side of the neck and it was, did not have any obvious metastatic disease, I'd probably just cover that with radiation. Um, I know that, you know, one of the emails that went around was talking about maybe sticking away from reconstruction, but what about a submental island flap to reconstruct this? Um, what do people think about that? Totally agree. Would you be I think okay it, with uh, level one clearance for, for the submental island? I worry about that. I, I worry about <laughs> it. And, I, and I've, I've never seen a recurrence in the neck in a patient that I've done a submental island flap on, but I have seen a recurrence in the neck that somebody else did and I took care of afterwards. Um, I also, I don't know, cosmetically, people look kind of weird after that operation. And <laughs> It certainly is not a good idea to do it on somebody with a beard like mine, okay? Where you know basically <laughs> going to put going to put this on somebody's tongue. It's horrible. So, um, you know, I we do a lot of forearm flaps here. We can get them done pretty expeditiously, and the success rates are pretty good. And so we tend to do forearm flaps um, okay. for this sort of thing. Very good. All right, Tabita. So at this point in time, she was, you know, we were, we were anticipating her to clinically be a T2N1 M0. And so just exactly the same discussion about the primary and the neck. And this is the point where she brings up that she is a very busy career as a successful family and marriage counselor. So a few things that are very important to her is that she is highly dependent on the intelligibility of her speech um, and the professional demeanor and her professional appearance for maintaining career success. Now she she is not an overweight female, but she does have a, a slight jowl, um, but not a large amount that we would be able to, to get a whole lot of tissue from her submental area either. Um, and she has just this high level of anxiety regarding her career maintenance. Um, and then here's just that picture of her, um, her tumor just kind of as a reminder. So one question that I was a little bit interested in, I know you, you all covered it, but just hearing from some of you experts, how, how you kind of approach this patient in your clinic, as far as you have any protocolization that you put them through when they, when you're talking about an oral cavity reconstruction, do you, do you get other players on the team to come in and talk with them ahead of time preoperatively, or do you kind of put that on the back end after, after you see them for their speech rehabilitation, their swallowing rehabilitation and all those sorts of things? Okay. You want me to ch Bill? chime in here? Go ahead, Pete. Yeah, please. So, you know, we have a very large group of speech language pathologists that actually are kind of part of our department. And um, really, we have them see every patient pre op. Um, sometimes patients are kind of wondering why the hell they're seeing them. Sometimes I wonder the same thing, but they pretty much see everybody pre op. It's been a little bit, a little bit harder since. Uh, COVID, but actually they can do a lot of this virtually. It's, it's mostly just talking. And um, I often joke around that they're like our psychotherapists. I mean, they're our counselors because they spend a long time with the patient, both before the operation and afterwards. And so I, I think it's very important for all these people, even if they're not a marriage counselor or, you know, a college professor or well, lawyers, we don't care about, but, you know, doctors, um, it, I think it's important for all these people to get that kind of preoperative counseling if they can. And I would concur. And I think, you know, you bring up a really very important point, Tabitha, and that is that you want to make sure that you get uh, people um, in your system and be consistent with what you do. Just like uh, Pete was saying, you know, the speech and uh, language pathologists see all our new patients. Um, we would also have our dental oncologist see this lady. Um, and again, all of this is part of the counseling, but we also uh, uh, ad advise on counseling and uh, we consider antidepressant prophylaxis, particularly if we think there's a, a role in, for radiation because that's where it's really a substantial uh, preventer of depression and en enhances quality of life. Um, and then as I think your, your broader point is um, what kind of materials and things of that nature. I think it's also important. We, we like most people, give packets uh, for what to anticipate in the operation. Uh, we give them reading material um, and we uh, try and give them as much information ahead of time. 
and uh, numbers to call. And, you know, nurse navigators are really critical. All right. Yes. So. Love you. Love you too. Bye. Bye. All right. So in the interest of time, and we have two more cases to go through, uh, Talca, why don't you uh, tell us uh, how, what did you decide? Sure, I'll get to that part uh, right here. So we we did exactly what uh, what kind of the consensus was, the, the partial glossectomy, neck dissection, and for her best speech and cosmetic outcomes, uh, radial forearm preflap is what we felt was best. So um, here's kind of the tumor taken down to pathology once we took it out. Um, we had them do our marginal analysis and the lovely pathology photograph for, for doing intraoperative marginal analysis. And then her final pathology ended up being a 2.6 by 2.5 centimeter, but the depth of invasion was a little bit more than where I had done the punch biopsy at. So, you know, our pathologists always, always absolutely love this 0 0.95 or 0 0.99 centimeters of depth. So just to keep it right in the T2, so T2N1, she did have positive lymphovascular negative perineural. Um, all of her margins were negative and that 1.3 centimeter node and then just a small micrometastatic papillary thyroid cancer on there on top of everything else. So um, here's her here's her pictures. I did trach her just because she had some leukoplakic extension that we also got out from her floor of mouth. So we anticipated her to have a little bit of swelling but decannulated her quickly. Um, and she went on, she did go on to get adjuvant, um, adjuvant therapy. Um, because she was so close to the, the T3 mark, so. So Pete and Bill, would you radiate this woman? We have LVI, 2.3, T2, one node. I probably would. Mm -hmm. So she meets the, the minimal indication for or the, I think the minimal is the right word to say. Um, she, let me put it differently. She minimally meets the indication for radiation, but I would be, I would have a really, um, long discussion with her because, well, LVI does increase the risk, no doubt about it, uh, for local regional failure. Uh, salvage is still possible. Um, and you're, you're radiating uh, a number of people that don't need it. And you're radiating some that won't benefit. So, you know, the number needed to treat here is probably close to seven or eight. Um, so I, I'm not so sure that it's a, a slam dunk. Um, but I, we would, you know, at our tumor board, she would meet the recommendation for, for radiation. And there is a very old paper that showed that in N1 disease, I think that came out in 1990s, the risk of failure is actually about like 10%. The N2 is like suddenly becomes 30%. So 10%, you bring that up to 5%. If with the radiation, I, I think Bill has a very great point. And but she unfortunately has to live with the consequence of radiation for the rest of her life. All right, great, fantastic case. You can see that a simple little itty bitty thing can have a lot of discussion. All right. What do you want to what do you want to do Let's about see. the what do you want to do about the papillary thyroid cancer? Oh, that's uh, Dr. Shaha's on the line. It's gotta go to Dr. Shaha. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it was she got her three uh, month post treatment PET scan, which of course pre pre PET and post, you know, no, nothing avid in her thyroid, of course, like like you would expect. So she's just going to get a get an ultrasound, ultrasound of her central neck, and just a quick ultrasound of her contralateral side. I'm assuming this side is you know absolutely clear, and then we'll we'll get her thyroid taken out when she's ready to miss a little time from work. But we're not rushing on that. Would you take the thyroid out, Pete? Um. You know, to be honest with you, I wouldn't, and I'd just ignore it, but uh, I would have a hard time. If anybody else got their hooks into her, they'd probably operate on her. I mean, I mean I'll mean, i be honest with you. I mean, how many thousands, hundreds, tens of thousands of people in the United States are walking around with this in the neck and they don't know it? And the thing that's going to kill this woman is her tongue cancer. Now, if she was 75 instead of 50, it'd be a little bit easier, or if she had five nodes positive in her neck. But I'd be, I'll be honest with you, I usually try to just ignore these things. Yeah, I, I would generally agree, although I do an ultrasound now. And, and if you have a nodule that's clear cut and, and looks like a papillary carcinoma, then I'd, I would finish your treatment and, and, and then deal with that. But yeah, I completely uh, agree with that. I mean, I, I follow them with ultrasound, but if there's nothing in the thyroid gland, I don't make a dedicated run at the thyroid gland. Got it. Awesome. Thank I you. agree. And I see also um, one, once Ashley put uh, her slides up. I also see Dr. Chris Holsinger joining us. Thanks, Chris, for joining us. Um, just trying to follow up. So hopefully we can ask other folks to also chime in. All right, Ashley, floor is yours. All right. 
at sharing the screen. Okay, guys. Um, I'm Ashley Mays from LSU, like we said before, and I appreciate the opportunity to present today. Um, so I have a lot less text on slides. I'm a minimalist. So um, hopefully I can just kind of stimulate some discussion based on some key talking points. We love it. I'm okay. a <laughs> All right. So um, I present today a 62-year-old patient with dysphagia for three months, as well as tongue pain and a 20 to 30 pound weight loss. You'll see here the um, history, some mild neck swelling uh, on this, uh, on the neck, um, but no significant past medical history, no prior head and neck surgery, um, was a heavy drinker, uh, works at a paper mill, no tobacco history and no family history of head and neck cancer. So in the physical exam in the clinic, um, uh, head and face were all uh, well within normal limits without skin lesions. Um, there was good dentition. Um, the tongue was mobile, normally with good projection um, and extrusion. Um, there was an ulcerative lesion of the right lateral tongue with some extension onto the lateral for, for floor of mouth. There was also some irregularity extending onto the lingual surface of the gingiva, the mandible on that side. Um, the oropharynx was clear tonsils were present. There was some subtle fullness on the right side as well, but no discrete palpable masses without um, any rotation restriction as well. So if, uh, on an endoscopy exam, everything was essentially uh, normal as well. So um, this is a uh, photograph of the lateral tongue lesion, very similar to our case prior. Um, the, the, the point of this case, though, I'll point out is, is the extent Disease along that lateral floor of mouth and into the gingiva and I was not able to find a very good and clear picture from this patient, but I wanted to point out in our discussion, that this is kind of what that kind of lingual surface of the mandible looks like going up on and by the teeth and along the gingiva. So we'll, we'll, we'll keep so, that. Go ahead. So you could see tumor on the gingiva, on the lingual Correct. surface of the alveolus. Correct. Is, was the tumor going between the teeth? Um, I don't believe it was in this case, but it was and a assume, teeth. Yeah. And, and I assume it was just a very flat tumor. There was not like a mass. You just see that. Correct. Kind of, okay. Right on Correct. the mandible. On yeah. the mandible. Of course, the primary, of course, the primary would have been in the tongue. It, it appeared, but uh -huh. it had encroached upon that floor of mouth and onto that, that gingival surface. Yes. All right. So it seemed like the mandible is the question here. Bill, how would you Correct. assess mandible in these cases? Uh, I think a thin cut CT does a great job. I think the the uh, dental films provide even more detail if you have that capacity. You know, having them get get a uh, an X ray from their a lateral PA from their um, dentist that also gives you a little finer detail. In this situation, the key thing here is you want to know is there clear invasion of the mandible, um, and you you know obviously check for uh, uh, any numbness of the cheek, um, but the chances are, it sounds like what Ashley's describing is probably more a dysplastic lesion, maybe some minimal invasion coming up. Um, unfortunately, you're, if it's going through the gingiva or between the teeth, uh, that's very hard to, to uh, resect without doing uh, a marginal mandibulectomy. And that would be the question. Do you do a marginal or do you do a segmental? Um, and if it's just barely onto the lingual, um, I will also just resect uh, mucosa if it's a more of a dysplastic lesion. So as long as there's not tumor stuck on the, um, stuck to the bone. Pete, what about MRI? Do you do MRI nowadays? You know, I, I do not, um, unless the person has like anesthesia of their mental nerve and I'm worried about perineural spread proximally, but you know, that sort of thing, you'd almost always see CT changes of bone erosion. Um, and so I, I don't do MRI scan routinely. Now, if you don't see any bone erosion mm -hmm. in the CT, what would you conclude from that? Well, you know, you, you can still have subtle erosions. You know, when people are edentulists, the mandible often has a very irregular contour, so it's kind of hard to tell. You can, you know, I think that 
if you look at the staging system, at least the last time I looked at it, you know, T4 disease was through the cortical bone, you know, not a little bit of erosion. So, I mean, I think if, if there's not obvious mandibular invasion, then you can usually handle that with a marginal resection, as long as the person's got enough mandibular height to have a mandible that's not going to break afterwards. Um, and generally, if they're dentate, they will. I think that the harder thing is, is when you've got this superficial mucosal change, which is coming up on the attached gingiva up towards the teeth. And you, you know, do you do a marginal resection and sacrifice the teeth, which is a big deal? Or do you do some sort of a mucosal resection and you wind up exposing the roots of the teeth and sometimes they wind up going anyway. And if you do a flap, how do you secure it? And all these sorts of things. And I mean, I think the, the most oncologic thing is to do the marginal resection, but it is a big step to sacrifice somebody's multiple teeth on one side. Okay. Yeah. And one question that I, that came up in our, our discussion um, and comes up with about a number of our patients is what's the best way to do your exam, right? Sometimes it's very difficult in a patient with pain to do a very complete oral cavity exam with them in the clinic chair. Um, and so um, sometimes we have the discussion of just putting them to sleep briefly. You're going to do your esophagoscopy and your, you know, your bronchoscopy and everything else as well. Why not just do our good exam and our biopsy at that time? And so how to make that decision between which patient requires an, an anesthetic for a good exam versus someone else? Because obviously in this situation, if you end up doing a segmental, that really changes your reconstructive plan as well versus potentially you know, something very local or, or a soft tissue flap. And so I would, I'd be interested so, to hear your perspective. Yeah. Fantastic question. When for an oral cavity, you think it's actually, you have to do an EUA. Uh, Bill, let's start with you. I mean, oral pharynx, larynx, we always do that, but oral cavity. Yeah, almost never. Um, I think uh, I'm trying to think of the last time that we would have done an EUA to get a biopsy and to assess something. Uh, what we usually do, and I, your point's well taken, though. Uh, it actually, it's a the getting a sense of the feel of the tumor is really critical because you want to know is it mobile off the mandible uh, or is it stuck to the mandible. That's really a critical uh, distinction. So, uh, I, I guess maybe we're just uh, cruel here, but we usually just would <laughs> would go ahead and do it and hope they didn't bite us. So what about you, Pete? Yeah. Well, so, you know, when I was a resident, every patient went for a separate dedicated triple endoscopy, and then they came back and had the resection. And, and, you know, to a certain extent that was still done at our VA hospital for a while. It's a great teaching. It's, it's great for teaching because the residents get lots of experience in doing endoscopy. But um, nowadays I usually just do the examination at the time of their definitive procedure, unless I have a question that I can't answer unless I put them to sleep. And so, you know, you know, what's the extent of the tumor, especially for like a supraglottic laryngectomy, or if the patient is in such pain that they can't tolerate a biopsy, or if they've had a previous attempt at a biopsy in the office, that's kind of failed twice. And you're still looking at the lesion saying that's gotta be cancer. And sometimes I'll just put them to sleep and do a big biopsy and send it for a frozen and stuff like that. So I, I do think there is a role for it, but, um, you know, nowadays we've got flexible scopes, we've got MRI scans, CT scans, PET scans. I mean, we've got all this diagnostic stuff that people didn't have 50, 60 years ago. So I think the role has become relatively limited. Okay. You know, but Babic, I would just comment that there are select circumstances where your exam just is, is um, inadequate, right? And so I think in those specific circumstances, it is very low impact to put the patient to sleep, do an excellent exam and really be clear about the resection because it's really no fun when you plan for one thing in the operating room and then you have to back out of it and plan for a thing all, all something else entirely because you have the wrong flap teed up or the tumor is more extensive. So you know, there, I'm sure every surgeon has had select circumstances where um, you know, the exam just really is inadequate. And I, I think I would have a very low threshold to put those patients to sleep to look. Yeah, I, I don't disagree with that. I think that um, I, what we would typically do, for example, if we were thinking about a marginal versus a segmental, is that we would prepare for both. Um, and if they were going to use a fibula, for example, or or even osseocutaneous uh, radial forearm, both of those things would be consented. But and then you do your exam 
you know, as they go to sleep for their procedure and make that game time decision. But I, I certainly don't disagree that if you think that you need more information and it's really going to change what you're going to do, by all means, uh, putting him to sleep is not anywhere near the end. I think that the point for the fellows and uh, like, there's no shame. This is probably a rare situation in, in with a lot of patients and a lot, a lot of uh, jelly lidocaine and all this stuff. You can a lot of time get it with the imaging. But if you need to take the patient to the OR, you take the patient to the OR. You do the, what's right for you in your environment. Okay. All right. Let's see. Very good. Thank you so much. Um, so here we have oh um, some axial cuts um, of a contrasted CT scan. And so I will just uh, take you through these several slices. So again, we have a right-sided lateral tongue lesion. These are some more superior cuts here. So I'll move down closer toward the jaw. So on the left, you'll see, um, again, approaching down toward the floor of mouth. And on the right, you start to see um, a little bit of encroachment toward the mandible a little bit more anteriorly. I should have another view here. Um, this is a little bit further down um, showing the um, anterior floor of mouth, which appears clear. So it looks like the cortex in, is intact. Oh, no. Correct. Okay. Yeah, I, I have some bone cuts um, yeah. on the next slide if you prefer that, yeah. So um, this, uh, there was a little bit of, this, these are the, for the fellows, these are the um, bone windows on, on the, the, the same scan. So um, this is the same view from the floor of mouth. And there's a little bit of haziness here, but um, I think that's just the cut. But I just wanted to point out that um, so when I was a fellow, I, I oftentimes confused haziness as, as some kind of erosion on a scan. And that's not always the case, right? And so you have to always scroll through the different, the views. Um, but on the right, you can see that the cortex was intact for the most part, and there wasn't any clear erosion. This is the PET scan. Mm -hmm. and you'll see a tumor that involves um, mostly the soft tissue, uh, lateral tongue, and floor of mouth um, without encroachment okay. on the, the mandible. Yeah. So, um, all right, we, we have to move on quickly. Um, Bill, this looks like a bad player here. I don't like the way that this tumor looks. What would you, uh, what would you do? Yeah, I completely agree. This is in contradistinction to the first case. This is much deeper and it's much longer. Um, now I didn't see the full neck, uh, so I didn't see any nodal disease, but I certainly would not be surprised at nodal disease, but let's assume that there isn't. I would absolutely do an elective neck on this and this one, a hemiglossectomy. And again, depending on your clinical exam, if it's just barely onto the lingual aspect of the mandible, even if it's on the attached, I would just, I would resect the, the mucosa. But uh, my threshold for doing a marginal mandibulectomy would be very, very low in this case. I'd, I think, likely do it based on so, uh, what I heard. Perfect. Uh, Pete, mandible segmental or marginal? I mean, look like the hemiglossectomy is like given here because it was yeah. very close to the midline. I think uh, probably thinking more marginal um, just because the, I don't know, this, this, this haziness that was discussed, that could be partial volume averaging, you know, just some irregularity along the court, the uh, superior aspect of the mandible. Um, and I, I'm thinking more marginal, but it's, I wouldn't, I wouldn't criticize anybody for doing a segmental for it. The, the problem, you know, the, the, the issue is, is that if you're not prepared for a segmental, then, you know, you haven't planned it out and you don't have all your pre-cut cutting jigs. And we're kind of back to the way it was 10 years ago, where you just kind of eyeballed things and kind of stuck it back together, which, you know, worked sometimes, but it was really unpredictable. And I think the, with the pre pre-op planning that we have nowadays, you just get a better, a more consistent result, I guess I'd say that way. Um, but I still think marginal on this one. Uh, but okay. I could make a quick comment um, and we have to move on to the next one, but this is one I think I would strongly consider doing it on block with level one. You know, the, the deep extension and the posterior extension, if you think of reflecting the mylohyoid form forward, you're going to get right into the deep aspect of the tumor. You're not going to be saving the lingual nerve regardless. It, you know, everything it's going to is going to be removed. And mm -hmm. To be honest, most likely the hypoglossal the same way. You're taking out that half of the tongue. So this is one that, it, you know, depending on you make your mandible decision either way. And then whatever, if you're saving any of it, you, you know, detach just on the periosteum side and, and 
if you take some of the top bone grade, if you you know have your deciding the mansion yeah. animal, but then just taking it on block with level one, I think is a little cleaner oncologic sure. clearance. So to take the on block for level one, we are going through floor of mouth, sublingual gland, myelohyoid, and to get to the other side. Do you think that um, we need to get the myelohyoid as well? I, I don't, I usually don't do it unless there's gross invasion, but I know that uh, there is a school of thought and I have a respect for it. So Bill and Pete, would you do unblock for these? Yeah, so I think it's a, Mike brings up a good point. I, I would not do it on, I would probably not take the uh, myelohyoid. I agree with you. I would just retract it up, but it, you know, you're taking the gland and it is nice to keep that together so that pathologically they don't call a positive or a, a close deep margin when it's actually sitting on the sublingual gland and the and or posteriorly on the submandibular. So I don't. So go ahead, Pete. You know, I do like to do these um, from above and below. And I come from below, I get subperiosteal and the lingual aspect of the mandible. Take the mylohyoid off of the mylohyoid line. You need to extend your incision in the floor of mouth all the way over to the other side. Take down the stylomandibular ligament and posterior belly of the digastric and all the styloid muscles. Um, take the lingual artery and then just kind of drop the tongue out into the neck um, and then resect it out that way. Now, doing that with a marginal is really hard um, because you have to make your cuts from the from the buccal aspect of the mandible and then get all the way through and have it remain attached. Um, and if you go subperiosteal too far up towards the alveolar ridge, it's just going to come out as, as a single piece. But I do a lot of, I do a lot of these sorts of tongue resections that way, kind of dropping them out into the neck and then just kind of coming down the middle of the tongue, uh, putting my finger into the oropharynx and kind of cutting down around the tonsil and then taking the tumor out that way. And you, you wind up taking the, the primary out with the submandibular gland and most of the submandibular triangle level one nodes kind of as a single piece. Um, makes it a little hard to reconstruct, but that's Wax's problem, not mine. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, Mike, fantastic point. Thank you. All right, Ashley. Yes, oh, we need to move on. Okay, we, go ahead. Yeah, we did, a, just as you discussed, we did a hemiglossectomy um, with a marginal when we're able to uh, negative margins with that as, as well as section. And so uh, she was dispositioned to post-op. So thank you very much. What's the reconstruction? Um, a very thin patient, so a, a ALT. Oh, ALT, very mm -hmm. good. So you basically reconstructed the tongue and the entire floor of mouth on the, on the right side. Yeah, and kind of use it to resurface that, that area where the marginal was taken, yes. Now, quick question. This is still unilateral, but it's very close. Unilateral neck or bilateral neck? Um, and then neck well, we did a, um, a limited uh, super omohyoid on the, the contralateral side as well. You did limit. Okay. Bill, would you do a unilateral or bilateral for this? So again, the, you know, the same thing as before, if we were trying to avoid radiation, in this case, you have a much higher risk of contralateral disease with that size and with the anterior and the middle extent, there were kind of on that CT scan, it looked like there was some, you know, you were right to the, uh, to the midline of the tongue there. So I, I would be more inclined to, if I were going to avoid uh, radiation. Now, this one is pretty good size and you were doing a hemiglossectomy. Again, I'm not sure about the nodes, uh, but uh, I'd be a little more, maybe a little more reluctant to, to avoid radiation. Maybe. It unilateral bilateral. Uh, I would do unilateral. Um, I mean, this person needs radiation post op. I mean, yeah. pretty clearly, and so I would do unilateral if there was no obvious nodal disease in the other side of the neck. Um, Sounds good. But okay. I wouldn't. Cre I wouldn't criticize Evan. you for yeah. doing the other side. Yeah, I, I agree. All right, fantastic case. Thank you so much, Ashley. Also, um, just a briefly, I really like the uh, interlateral thigh flap in hemiglossectomies because it gives you more tongue uh, bulk, and uh, I, I find that a, a great choice if they're not too if they're not obese. So, yeah. I agree. you know, Thank you. 
I think we underestimate the morbidity of the forearm donor site and the ALT flap is great. Uh, like you said, Bill, but first, if, if somebody's skinny, you know, I really like it too. Yeah. All right. Do you have more uh, pictures of your uh, recon? Okay. So if you just stop sharing, we'll have uh, Evan. Thanks for being patient. No problem. Chris, let me ask you why Evan very good. Unilateral or bilateral in your hands in, at Stanford? I would do exactly what Ashley did. I'd do that contralateral 1B and 2, kind of mm -hmm. the super hyoid neck. Got it. Perfect. And, and that's because early on, I had someone, and I apologize, I'm in multiple meetings. And when it goes really deep like that, early on in my career, before radiation started, I had in a CT scan, this is before PET scans were widely seen, I had a node pop up contralaterally. And I said, wow, that is never happening again. <laughs> um, and so when it goes deep, and, and toward the other side, I'll do that sort of 1A, 1B, 2A on the other side. Perfect. Thank you so much. All Thanks right, Thanks for Evan. the question. Well, of course, anytime. Okay. Um, so this one, I think, continues some of the things we discussed before. So it's an 81-year-old uh, Caucasian female with a history of a right floor of mouse cell carcinoma, had surgery and adjuvant radiation in 2019. Um, done at an outside hospital with someone in complete records who was, um, I think, referred to us with a non-healing ulcer of the uh, right side of the mandible following some dental extractions. Um, she had a history of AFib, um, coronary artery disease, and MI. She had a stent. Um, she's just on aspirin, so uh, not on Eliquis for her AFib, uh, depression, hypothyroidism. She lives with her 84-year-old husband who recently had a stroke um, and is a never smoker, never drinker. And um, this is what the oral cavity exam looks like in clinic. Is that exposed bone or just a necrotic ulcer? Um, yes, all of it. Um, <laughs> I, I think in, in these situations in the setting of recent dental extractions, I, I, I think the thought was maybe RN, maybe cancer, maybe really bad healing, but I think all were on the table with varying probabilities of what was underneath it. Okay. So um, that was biopsy and eventually came back as um, squamous cell carcinoma. And then the rest of her exam was not particularly uh, interesting. No trismus, she's a dentalist. There was the ulcer. Mm -hmm. um, she didn't have a lot of radiation fibrosis in her neck and otherwise cranial nerves two through 12 were intact. So and then this is what her- Oh yeah, perfect. looked like. Oh yeah. Um, so Bill, 81 year old evidentialist, previous radiation, <laughs> taking care of an 83 year old husband. Yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. This is a social issue. This is a social nightmare. A um, lot of good cons you know, um, discussions are going to be have to be held ahead. And she's going to need help. She's, uh, you know, in this situation, uh, osteocutaneous radio forearms not going to work. It's too big a deficit. Um, you know, you're looking at, at essentially a, a hemimandibulectomy here, it looks like, depending on how far it's coming up um, with the radiation, uh, especially. I, I would absolutely offer her surgery, though, um, because, you know, with a, particularly with limited uh, morbidity from her radiation, you have to wonder, A, did she really get the full dose? And, and B, what kind of an operation did she have? And uh, was it, you know, did they leave positive margins? Did they kind of do a, a limited resection and then radiate? Um, so, you know, I would not give up on this lady in terms of oncologic uh, success. Um, it's obviously going to be, uh, a, you know, a pretty big hit to her. And with a husband with a stroke, it's going to completely change her life and his, um, most likely, because she's going to need help for months yeah, tell us how. So you're the junior attending. You're definitely gonna get this case. There's no question. What would you offer? I think I just had this case actually not too long ago. Um, I know from experience. <laughs> um, you know, we, I usually talk a lot about the social situation with them too, and try to figure out what's pretty important for them without kind of giving up on the oncologic component, which usually falls to the reconstructive discussion. Um, so I would definitely offer them a, a resection and, and then I would probably look pretty closely at her health as well and, and talk to her about what we could get her back with faster. So 
potentially you could put a bar there and you could wrap it with something, you know, after you do the, the segmental component um, or I would, I would talk to them if they're game, they may do okay with, with the bony reconstruction as well in that area. What's your preference, fibula or scapula? Fibula. Okay. Pete, what would you do? I, I think we all we used to, when I was a resident with you, we all used to talk about little old lady with tongue cancer. Well, this is a little old lady with uh, alveolus cancer. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I, I would definitely think, so. <laughs> I would definitely offer this person surgery. I mean, if, the, if you don't do it, I mean, people are like, oh, I'm too old for a big operation. And I'm like, well, yeah, then you're just going to break your jaw and have pain and tumor coming out of the side of your face and you'll be back and then you'll be begging for an operation. But I would try to keep it relatively simple and, and I would do a resection and then I would probably just put a bar in there and uh, she's edentulous. So you don't really need to worry about, you know, getting her occlusion perfect. And I would probably, if she was skinny here, we'd probably wrap it with an ALT. If she was if she was chunky, we'd probably use a radio forearm flap. I worry about fibular flaps in people over eighty because, you know, even though ultimately the results are pretty good, these people are kind of hobbled for a number of weeks and months, and um, I think that they spend a lot of time sitting in a chair and in bed, and they just get very weak, and it's hard for these older people to recover from these operations that really make it so it's difficult to walk. So we, mm -hmm. I tend to try to stay away from the fibular flap and the 85 year old little old lady sort of thing. Okay. All right, Evan. Yeah, so I think um, you guys highlighted many of the important considerations. I think Bavik appropriately said, it's sort of unclear how much surgery she had. Did she have a biopsy and a lot of radiation definitively? Like, you know, there's nothing, there's nothing in the mouth. Like, I don't know where the incisions and in prior surgery was. Like she didn't have a lot of radiation damage in her neck. Was, that part was unclear. I think we also were sympathetic to quality of life issues for lack of local control for these people. So um, for all those reasons offered her surgery, surgery was um, exactly the guys outlined a segmental mandibulectomy. Um, we went through the variety of reconstructive options, osseous flap versus soft tissue and bar, ALT versus forearm based on her habitus. And she's, she was um, had somewhat larger thighs. So we did a forearm uh, and then just harvested some fat uh, extra fat with it to cover the plate. So it didn't extrude. Um, but then also had her meet the rest of the multidisciplinary team to talk about whether systemic therapy or palliative therapy made the most sense. Um, and then just like you said, we kept it simple. Um, so this is the plate. Uh, this is it from the front. And then we just put a, just put a soft tissue flap um, at that time. So if you so, do a soft tissue flap, why do a free flap? Why not just do a pec? Yeah, it's a great question. I think in a, in a, female patient, the uh, additional fat that was going to come with her pack was not going to fit very well in her, in her mm -hmm. mouth. Um, but certainly would, a regional flap would have been a very reasonable, a super cloud would have not been an unreasonable choice in that situation as well. And did she get radiation afterward? So she did not. And this is, I think, where some of the, the just, we definitely, she lived far away and um, the, the, the radiation oncologist close to home was uncomfortable re-irradiating her based on what they eventually discovered from prior radiation records. Um, so she had a relatively uncomplicated hospital course, um, eventually got back to an oral diet. Um, we found a family member who was able to come take care of her. Um, she did not get re-irradiated and then she wound up, I took out the slide, but recurred uh, with dermal mets three to four months after uh, surgery. Okay, great. So fantastic case. Well, I would say every time I put a bar, if the patient survived, the bar always extrudes. <laughs> so yeah. nowadays I'm very afraid of putting a bar with that bone. But I'm curious to hear from Bill and Pete and others. And then we have a, a question from one of the fellows. Would you consider not doing a bar, just do a soft tissue and let her swing? The answer is yes, I would. And I do do that sometimes. And for a posterior mandibular defect, I actually did that just recently for a posterior mandibular defect, especially in a person who is edentulous, I will sometimes just let them swing. Um, and I, I will take out the condyle because I've had the condyle kind of be pulled medial by the pterygoid muscles and cause mm -hmm. some pain. So even if it doesn't need to come out, I usually take it out. Um, and then it, you know, use a kind of, you can use a bulkier flap. You could use 
an ALT flap in a chunky thigh and it actually kind of fills them out pretty well. But if they're dentate, I usually don't like to let them swing because they, they wind up with terrible malocclusion. Bill? I would agree. I think the only thing, and I certainly agree with soft tissue uh, alone um, when that's, uh, when it's uh, parasymphysis or posterior. When you get to the symphysis, which is where this one yeah. looks to be, uh, it's really, I, I don't like to do that because it causes such a caving in of the face. You get even, you get a lot of mandibular shift, even with uh, in an edentulous person. In a dentate person, I absolutely would not do it. Um, on the other hand, I, I agree with you, Bavik. I think uh, I, my, <laughs> my memory of plate, of seeing plates in clinic is too high uh, for, to, be much of an enthusiast, especially when it's that long. Um, I would still, I, I get the idea that fibulas are more morbid, but I think in this situation, I probably would still have favored a fibula unless you had a, a particular reason not to. And again, 81 is not that old. <laughs> and it's getting younger every, every year. I get one year older, everything gets younger a little bit. <laughs> Um, so, uh, Evan, I think Judy Esconer is it with, you, with you guys at MUSC. I mean, she's like the master of fibula, uh, scapula. How come you not know uh, scapula? Yeah, so I think, you know, the, the initial, um, I think, discussion was, was osseous flap or not <clears throat> flap. You know, I think to, um, oh, oops, went wrong way. To Bill's point, I, th I think, I don't know this shows it well. I think the defect was it stopped behind the mental nerve. So it was, it was behind the parasympathetic region on that side. If it had come more anterior, we absolutely would have done an osseous flap. Then I think it is a bit of a question of like whether the extra OR time, the extra little bit of OR time that comes with the scapula is better compared to the hobbling that happens from the fibula for the first couple of weeks afterwards. Um, and I do agree with the, that 81 year olds who may not have great mobility ahead of time really do suffer for those first couple of weeks afterwards. So yes, yeah, scapula would have not been an unreasonable option, assuming we wanted to add the extra couple of hours and the defect a little bit more um, anterior. Ashley, what would you guys do? Yeah, definitely. I, I would certainly do a fibula. It's, it's, uh, it's certainly my um, uh, much more expertise than a scapula. And, and this, particularly in an older patient, I don't want to wait until the ablation is over. I'd like to get started to get her off the table as quickly as possible. Is Arno still on? Arno, would you do a scapula for these cases or a fibula? I think Arno might have logged up. Cool. All right, fantastic yeah. cases. Thank you so much. Go ahead. Oh. I think maybe I we're doing it wrong. Maybe we're doing it here wrong here in Oregon. And I don't do free flaps but I do take care of people afterwards. And I've noticed a lot of wound healing problems with scapular flaps. Um, people mm -hmm. are laying on them all the time and their, their, their arm moves around a lot. We have a lot of, we have a lot of wound distances and a lot of seromas in these donor sites. And so I, I don't know if that's other people's experience. Mike, would you guys do a scapula? Uh, we do a lot of them uh, here. Uh, we leave drains in forever, at least two or three weeks. Yeah. Um, I'm not a fan of the spider arm. We've had a, some patients with some kind of uh, nerve praxias related to the suspension. I just have a medical student help me out a little bit with it. Um, but I think with this one, it, it, you know, the, if you were to do a fibula, if it were especially a younger patient, if you go back to the scan, it is going out a little bit onto the buckle, so you may have to take some buckle soft tissue. And then a radiated patient, you would wanna choose the leg, probably the right leg that would wrap your soft tissue envelope lateral to the plate, if you were to use a fibula. I, I may use a scapula, it's tough to say, it's all the eyeball tests in the clinic, but it will protect your plate more since you don't have to reach far medially to like the tongue or anything. Uh, if you were to use this fibula, that's what I would do. Okay, perfect. Well, it's uh, eight oh four. Sorry, just one quick. I've, uh, there was a Evan put in the slides WPOI five, which I, I assume Evan, you're referring to the Brandywine classification for patterns of invasion. So I put the PubMed link for um, that. It's um, WPOI five is the worst pattern of invasion. 
Type five is the invasive islands, which is highly associated with local recurrence. And these are the ones we all get burned on when you send the margins and they see these like islands and you can't clear the margins. So um, that's the reference that I put in, in the um, yeah, chat. Perfect. Great book, yes, I, thank you. And that's, yeah, and that's probably, you know, people who have history of radiation, they do get these worst pattern of invasion more common, which is unfortunately this uh, lady with the great operation, he might not be out of the woods yet. All right, well, we could have had a uh, continued this discussion for another half an hour easily. Uh, thank you so much. This was fantastic. It was a fantastic start to our new academic year. Uh, our next session is going to be in uh, September. Uh, Dr. Moore will be the host. Uh, and we look forward to have all of you again. Uh, thank you again for all of our guests, uh, Dr. Evan Graboy, Dr. Ashley May, and Dr. Uh, uh, Tebata Ratnam. This is a common note. Give me one second. Dr. Tabitha Galloway and my good friends, Dr. Peter Anderson and Dr. Bill Idiot and our partners in crime, Dr. Jeffrey Liu and Mike Moore and Arna Bewley at CDMS. We are looking forward to see you in September. Have a great night. Have a great rest of summer. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks everybody. For inviting me. Great session. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.